Welcome to Teams Tuesday. It's April the 20th, 2021. It's 12.15 in New York. It's 5.15 in London. It's 10.45 in Mumbai. We have a great speaker, Gorkin, from Belgium, who's discussing Zero to Hero, Microsoft Teams, tips and tricks that empower everybody. I'm your host, Peter Ward, from New York City. Stay tuned for the next 45 minutes. It's Teams Tuesday. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Bonjour, hello, good morning, good morning. What is Microsoft Teams? Microsoft Teams is a container with all of those artifacts in this underlayer scenario. So it's using SharePoint for storing the files. It can be extended with Power Automate and Power Ups to bring intelligence into Teams. You now have the tasks, which is actually part of, or actually something part of Planner, where you can have your tasks, add Planner plans, which you manage those tasks. You have the conversations, audios, and videos to have some calls, to have some video calls with your colleagues. You know, you can even have some tabs with SharePoint framework solutions. You, you don't care about where the solution is. It's in SharePoint, in Teams, in the cloud, on premises. No, you just use your solution in tabs. Build on the M365 groups model, which can be extended with the bot framework and lists. So as you can see, all of them is part of Teams. It is a correct statement to say that if one of those artifacts have issues, well, Teams will have issues. If the SharePoint data center or the SharePoint service has an issue, well, your files will have issues as well. It is a correct statement to say that all of those artifacts is part of Teams, and Teams is actually nothing without SharePoint, is nothing without the M365 Groups model, etc., etc. This is the one single slide that you have to remember. Actually, print it out, hang it on the wall, and watch every day. And let me take my red highlighter. I have my team, and every single time I provision a team from the Teams client, well, a group is provisioned for me. And that group will create a SharePoint site, a shared mailbox for the conversations, a OneNote notebook for my notes, and still Skype for business artifacts. Why? Because every single time, whenever you want to manage your Teams environment with PowerShell, well, it still uses the Skype for business artifacts, You're still, so you still need it. All of them will be created for you every single time when you create a team. If you create a SharePoint site, well, if it's a group connected, it will create a group. And if you create a group, you have the option to select, make it connected to a team, which we call Teamify. So every single time, if you create a group, which actually can be connected to a team, well, you will have that flow. You can extend that experience and add some of those more artifacts coming outside of the Teams ecosystem, like Power BI, Flow, Dynamics, or even go outside of the Microsoft ecosystem out of the box and get the Google connector to get data from Gmail or even get the Dropbox connector and get data from Dropbox. And then you can go on the Azure side, you know, leaving the Office 365 and going to the Azure side of stuff. You can build your own applications and consume data or bring data to Teams. One of those perfect examples is the notification hub. If you want to build an application, you can send notifications to Teams or bring notifications from Teams to you. You can even use Azure Media Services or even pipelines to monitor any of those applications in the Office 365 tenant. Then you have a single SharePoint site here, which is actually not connected to this one. This is what we call the private channels. We know that whenever you create a private channel, it is a standalone SharePoint site and that is not group connected. The main reason why it's not group connected is that the Office 365 admins cannot access your data. 
So it is standalone, so only people part of that site can actually access the data. This is the Teams components, how Teams has been built. Please print it out, learn it, watch it, because every operation you have will have impact. That means that if you create 5,000 Teams, you have 5,000 groups, 5,000 share points. If we go from the components to the storage side, remember I told you every artifact is being used for something specific, an experience. Well, basically a shared mailbox, well, it is for the conversations, it is for your emails. If you go for the SharePoint, well, basically you have the SharePoint site for storing the team files, or you have a connector to OneDrive to store the personal files. The Skype for Business, as an example, you have the voice mails, the recordings. What you need to know from that slide is the last one. Microsoft is moving away from storing the videos from stream and they go to OneDrive. Why? Because they couldn't basically have all of those experiences as storing, such as sharing, such as the APIs in stream. So basically they say like, okay, at least 75% of those videos in Teams are Teams recordings. So what they did is just move from stream to OneDrive so they could benefit from the store options, from the share options, from the APIs. So basically what you need to know is that the videos will be soon away from stream and come to OneDrive. Sharing a lot easier as well, I can tell you that. Yes, and this was the, one of the biggest needs, right? Because people couldn't basically share a video outside of their tenant. And with OneDrive now, it's going to be so, so easier. One of the complaints we got from customers was that if you and I were on a meeting and we had the recording and then we needed to have somebody else do it, you couldn't just send the link to the recording. You had to share it or put it into OneDrive. Yes. So it made the whole thing a bit, bit of a pain. Yeah, so I'm really glad that Microsoft listened to the feedback that partners and, and customers gave. And finally, it will be moved to OneDrive so we can have all of those experiences in one single screen. This is one of those slides that you can also print so you know where the files are stored. Teams is not a response for everything. Please don't do like everyone and propose Teams for anything. It has some advantages, yes, but it has also a lot of drawbacks. In a collaboration story, I always try to bring my project into four phases. In a targeted phase where I work alone, where my files could be on OneDrive or in Outlook. Then I have the inner circle in a project where I can actually draft my idea with the inner circle with a few people, where I can actually use Teams or SharePoint. The outer circle is when the idea is actually becoming an asset and I want to promote this into my team. Well, I could use Yammer or White Teams or even a communication site. And when it's public, well, I can use a public site or even use the portals. So Teams definitely has a place in the collaboration story. But is this a real solution for everything? Well, it's not. And it all depends in which phase you are and what you want to do. Well, if you look to Microsoft, well, they went away from Office 365 or basically they are going away from Office 365 to Microsoft 365. What is Microsoft 365? It is a combination of Office 365, Windows 10 as a service and the enterprise mobility and security, as you can see. And Teams is only a small part of that, right? Teams is only part of that wheel because you have the security on the left side, Windows 10 on top, you have the extensibility with the Power App, the Power BI and Flow, all connected to Azure, all connected to the graph. So when we talk about M365, Teams is part of that, yes, but Teams is not 100% of M365. It's only a part of that wheel. So now I will show you a few things that you probably didn't know with Teams. You have an environment with a lot of Teams. I have here one which is called, well, you know what? Let's create a new one just to show you. From scratch, a new private team, and I will call it NEC Tuesday Teams, right? I will create a new team. So basically in the back end, it will provision for me a group and that group will have a SharePoint site, will have a OneNote notebook, etc., etc. If I come here and add a new channel, well, I can give a new channel name, which is called marketing. Fantastic. 
I could make this as a standard as a private. Remember, I told you if you create a private one, it will create a separate site collection. But you know what? I will create it as standard and I will create that. Phenomenally, it, this will work. I have a new channel and within the channel, if I open this in SharePoint and let's hope that the provisioning is done. There you go. If I open in SharePoint, well, what you will see is under my shared document library in SharePoint, I have two folders, general and marketing. And if I go under my team, I have general and marketing. It is a correct statement to say that every channel you create will have a unique folder into SharePoint. No rocket science. If I add a new channel and here is a trick, if I add a new channel with the same name, it will say Gokun, you can't do that, which is normal, right? Because the name is already taken. But if I open the emoji bar with the window period button, well, I can add a lot of emojis to my channel and a lot of people, even Microsoft is doing that. So let's add maybe the dollar sign. I'm adding the dollar sign because I want to discuss about the marketing budget. Well, now I have a new channel. I will come to my files. It will work. I have my channels just here and I will add a new folder, folder called created into the dollar channel. And that folder will now be part hopefully here. I just need to refresh. But if I go to my marketing under files, well, you will see strangely that folder is now part on the marketing. I never created that folder into my channel, but it's part here. If I come back to my marketing dollar sign, well, it's here as well. Strange. What I will do is I will rename that to Gokun's folder. I do that right here. If I come under marketing, it has been renamed as well. So what happens in the back end is if I refresh my SharePoint, well, the engine which takes the data from Teams to SharePoint couldn't translate the dollar sign. And what SharePoint said is, oh, I already have a marketing folder, so I will use the existing one and not create a new one. So you have two channels connected to one folder, which can be a big, big, big issue for organization. But what's actually even worse with that is if I add a new one, marketing, with the hard sign, because I want to discuss about the love that the marketing is getting in my team. Well, you would expect to get the same folder here, but suddenly you don't. If I come to SharePoint and hit on refresh, well, now the engine could translate the hard sign to an ASCII code, and now I have a folder. It's again problematic because remember, if I just add a new channel and if I hit on the emoji bar, I have a lot of emojis. Could you imagine you testing every emoji and see which one is working well and which not? Well, honestly, I didn't test all of them. I just tested a few one and the dollar sign and the heart sign are a perfect example to show you which one is working and which not. What's really annoying as well with that channel is you could have something like that. A Gokun is not cute and you could actually create some channel like that. Well, you could even start collaborating on that, but then your manager could say like, oh my gosh, Gokan, well, this is not cool. Please don't do that. This is not good at all. It's not professional. So what you're gonna do is you will edit this channel and rename it to Project Falcon if you're working on a Falcon project, as an example again. Well, from a team's perspective, this is now changed. Phenomenal. However, if you come to your SharePoint, well, you may refresh a thousand times. Well, Gokun is not cute, will still remain. So what do a lot of people? They hit on the three dots and they rename. They will do something like that. Project Falcon, they rename. Well, you would expect that SharePoint will blame you, but no, it, it leaves you and it says, okay, the folder has been renamed, cool. So what I will now do is I will come back to my Project Falcon, hit on files and now Congrats, you have broken the link between SharePoint and Teams. What will people do is, hey, no worries, I have a retry button, I will retry. And -doom, your folder is now suddenly working again, but again with the same name. And if I come back to my SharePoint, 
I have something like that, which is called go can not shoot. What I actually give as a tip to my to my employees or to at the events um, is to use unique identifiers when you create teams or channels. Because remember, even if you rename the Teams Tuesday just here, and I will just edit this team and I could just, you know, make this Goku and I can change that. Well, easily this will be changed, but the unique URL here in my browser will still remain Tuesday Teams and the Gokun will never be added on top of that. So what I say to everyone is please, and whenever you actually add a channel or a team, use naming conventions and unique ideas like channel about Project Falcon and it's 2021, something like that. And whenever you do that, now you can change this to Project XYZ or anything you want. Now in Teams, in SharePoint, that will still remain as a unique idea. And you don't have to come basically to SharePoint because everything is done by, by Teams, but hey, now you can rename a thousand times your channel. No worries, it will still remain good into your SharePoint. Why couldn't you put the project, why don't you just put the description in the team or the channel description? That will be an identifier. Because what you've done is good, but if you're relying on end users, you know, you, you know the joke, the biggest mistake you can do is rely on end users to actually follow instructions. Yeah. So could you put the description in the team? So you mean this one? Yeah. It, it's possible, yes, you could do that. But in many projects I've been taking part of, well, basically when they see the optional, for them is a no-go, they won't do it. You have a few <laughs> people doing it, but whenever they see the optional, it's like, oh, I'll skip it. And Honestly, I prefer saying to my customers, to, to anyone coming to my sessions, bring the naming convention. Well, you have the naming convention options in the team admin center. You can enforce your team names. You can enforce your group naming. Do it because if you leave it open like I did, well, you will have a lot of issues at the end. And as an admin, you will be blocked by technical limitations. And I honestly want to avoid that. But yes, you're right. Oh, you exactly. the option site. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So one of those tips and tricks that I'm also giving is in a channel. Well, what you could do is you could easily delete any channel like this and this. And you know, it's like, like, okay, I don't need them anymore and I'm going to delete them. Well, fantastic. You can do that. Two things to remember. First of all, the data is not deleted from SharePoint. They just are deleted in Teams. So you cannot access it. But however, they still remain into your SharePoint. And secondly, as a Teams admin, well, if you come to manage a team under the channel section, well, you can still see the deleted channels and easily you can restore them. And if you hit on restore for this, it will restore the conversation as content. Something that not everybody is aware of that they can restore because they always had some bad feelings with SharePoint, with the SharePoint server times, but with Teams, it's actually extremely easy to, to restore some channels. Another tip, if you create a team from the bottom left corner, well, you can create a team as you can see here, you can join some public sites, or you can join a team with a code. I'm, I'm going to skip all of those, but I will show you the create a team. Well, you can create a team from scratch. I already showed that to you. Well, it's easily next, next. You choose the privacy and you create your team. You can create a team from a group. Remember in my slides, I said to you that if you have a group and you want to connect it to a team, well, that's typically the option, but then you have some templates. And those templates are actually from Microsoft. They actually built some templates for you that you could use, such the employee onboarding or manager project, which I will choose. And then you have some pre-built channels and apps for you. Well, you have the general announcement, resources, plannings, and a few apps that actually are built for you and you can use them. You could easily hit on next, then choose for a private or a public, give a name, give a description, and you can even customize your channels from here. The bad thing with that is, and a tip for you is, you cannot bring security on top of those templates. If you build a template, so if you go to the admin.teams.microsoft.com, if I'm not wrong, there we go. If you go on the admin center of Teams, on the 
team section, you have the team policies. And remember all the policies I've showed you, they are here, right? And we choose manager project, this one. If I edit this, well, easily I can add any channel, any app or part of that. And those are all the apps that we have seen. So I could easily come here and add an app or even better, I can create a new template and say like, okay, I like a new template and you can give a name, Gokens template. You can give a short description, a long description, hit on next, and then you can add your channels. I could say, okay, here is my channel one. And then I like to show it by default and I'll add an app for this, which is like SharePoint. But in no way here on that screen, and even if you add some apps, if you add like lists, in no way actually Microsoft is proposing you to avoid some groups or include some groups. It is by default open to everyone. So please be careful if you have industry specific templates or team specific templates, they are visible for everyone. Microsoft by default doesn't, doesn't really support that. Peter, you do know why. If you create a team from the templating engine, it takes forever to build the team. It yep. will take almost four or five minutes to build that team. But if you create a team like the classic experience, it takes only a few seconds, right? So if I just build this one, right? Look, if I just a private one and give a name, test time, and I just create that. Now, last time, remember when I built a team, in a few seconds, it was okay. Now, it's building, it's building, it's still building, and now after a timeout, it says like, feel free to close, and we'll say you when it's gonna be done. And honestly, it's gonna take up to maybe five minutes to build a few channels and bring those apps. And I've never could find a solution why it was so slow to build templates in Teams. In Teams, you have some really, really fancy features, extremely useful features such as the immersive reader and the translate option. We know that with the pandemic and with Teams, now there are no barriers anymore. A French could talk to a German, a German could talk to an American without any issues because we're all connected on the cloud. And you could have some people with this. Bonjour, Gokan, comment vas-tu? So he could write in, in, in French because English is not his native language. And you could say like, oh my gosh, in French, how am I going to respond to that? Well, basically you could copy paste in Google Translate and see what he meant, or you can just hit on the three dots and come here and say translate. So by default, if I'm not wrong, that option wasn't enabled in the early stages of Teams. Now it should be um, enabled by default. It's free. So please ask your admin to enable the translate option if it's not. So what you will see is now he will translate this the French text to English for me. Why in English? Because it's my preferred language. So if your preferred language is Spanish, he will translate or Teams will translate your text, your French text to Spanish. Well, you will get a new icon saying like, hey, this has been translated from French. Two things. One, you can recover and bring back the original message. So if I hit on the three dots, well, I can revert and see the original message and secondly the translate is only for me it is not because you have translated that that it's going to be available for everyone it's only for me what's really interesting as well is that people could just reply with this some people could even don't know what hamburger means so what you could do is actually go to the immersive reader and the immersive reader is something that comes from the education and it's really interesting to see how it can help bring you focus on text from non-American or non-native languages. So very simple options. You can just adjust the text size, increase spacing, change the fold, nothing rocket science. With my son, we're doing this a lot. If it's an English text, well, you could actually see the nouns, the verbs, adjectives, etc., etc. Nothing rocket science. Here begins the actually extremely important side of stuff. I can translate the whole template, the whole text to a language. And I could say like, okay, I like to see this in Azerbaijani. And then instead of showing word by word, I want the whole document. And now the Immersive Reader will translate the whole text for me in Azerbaijani. But what's really interesting is that you have the picture dictionary. And what is a picture dictionary? Well, you will see that in Azerbaijani, well, 
it's not available, but if I just choose one of those major languages, uh, English, well, now the picture dictionary is available. If you hit on the hamburger, well, the picture dictionary will show you an image of the hamburger, and it will even provide you the ways on pronouncing it into the original language as into the English, the translated language. But this doesn't really work, well, in two ways, with non major languages like Azerbaijani or with non-proper words like in French we can say alcola which is a coke if it's not recognized by the major language well it will not show you the, the bottle of the can of coca-cola it will however translate the thing but it will not show you the image okay a couple of questions here from brew he says if you find a spill on the classified data or pii or help in the conversation, can we delete it completely? So you delete it, it's going to go into the recycle bin. You could delete it. The other thing, okay, the, the answer to that question is, it's a bit of a challenge is because you back, if you're using a third party tool like Backify or an endpoint thing or Veeam, you've got it always, you've got it backed up and everything else, haven't you? Out of the box, I don't see a way on doing that. Maybe some vendors can do it. But out of the box, honestly, I don't see a way on how you can achieve that. For credit card numbers, yes, you have data loss prevention. But from specific words, I don't know. I think you could do preventative steps there. Like you could have sensitivity documents. So the moment that sensitivity document is put somewhere it shouldn't be, you can be notified. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. So the next thing I, I want to show you, which is really interesting as well, is that you can actually come on the three dots and add a lot of applications. A lot. It's like 800 apps that you can add and connect, consume through Teams. You have a bunch of applications. And honestly, I've only tested like maybe five or 10 of them. And you can add any of those apps as much as they're approved into the store. So you can even come here and submit an app to the catalog or upload a customized app. In one of my courses, we also go through on how you can build apps. We only have like five minutes left, so I'm not going to deep dive into that, but you can add a lot, a bunch of applications here in. If you come back to the admin center here, and I will just cancel this one, under the Teams apps, there we go. You have a list of all of those apps that are available for you in your Teams. I said 800, well, it's now more. It's like 983 items that you can basically allow or disallow in your Teams. Well, you can easily come here and say like, okay, I'm just gonna choose something without harming anyone. This app uh, is this, I have no idea what it is. Well, basically you can hit on one of those items to allow or block your app. If I block this app, well, nobody can actually see that app. If you block it, it won't be available for users. You could say, okay, I have a bunch of applications that I want to show. You can just come here and say like, okay, I'm going to do it one by one. Is it a good thing? Well, it depends. If you're a small organization, yes. If you're a very big organization, I recommend you using policies. And then you have some policies here as well. You have the global policy for my apps, which says we, well, Microsoft, did divide the apps in three catalogs, the Microsoft apps, the third party apps and the custom apps. And then you can easily say, I want to allow all my apps. I want to allow specific apps and block all the others. I want to block specific apps and allow others or I want to block all apps. I've never seen anyone blocking all the Microsoft apps would be crazy. But hey, the option is still there. You can do it. And if you feel free doing it, well, please test it and say me what you can do when you block all the Microsoft apps. But you can do the same for the third party apps. You can do the same for the custom apps. You can just block any app and bring them into your team's experience. One of them, which I really like, is the Power app because now you can work with Dataverse, the previously known CDS. So if I just start now within my environment, well, I have to choose the team that we have created, the Team Tuesday, and now it will create provision for me, an environment within my Dataverse. And that environment will be built actually just for me, just for my team, and I can bring any data into my Dataverse. So we'll wait a few seconds while he is building the environment for us into the Dataverse, and there we go. I have now my application, my Dataverse, 
actually connected to my team. So I'll just wait a few seconds, build a few tables and rows and publish it to my team to show you how easy it is to build a Dataverse connected app into Microsoft Teams. Let's hope that the demo gods are with me and that we will not have a crash. And there we go. Okay, while you're doing a quick question, why can't we allow external users when you can? That depends on your admin setup, I, I suspect. Unless you're referring to admin users of Teams rather than meetings. So whenever you have your environment created for you, just create a new table, um, you can just create and bring a name like table one. I'm just going very fast because we're short on time. I have my new table and you can just easily, as in Excel, create new columns. You can have a text column. I will create that and then I'll just choose a second one. I have like a, a, a choice where I have my choice one, which is in color this and then another one which is in color that. I can build anything very quickly into my database and then close this. And what you will see now is I have my Dataverse, my table connected to my app. I can just preview and then add a new record just here and say go can create, just giving some metadata and then choose my option and that data will now be stored into my Dataverse, right? Into my entity, into my Dataverse. If I publish this to Teams, now it will save my app, bundle it, and bring that application, which is not that fancy, but at the end, the advantage of Dataverse, it's, it's all about data and not about the artifacts around that. I will publish this under general, right? And I will save and close. Now the Power App will take that application, connect it to my Dataverse, and bring this under my Teams. So if I come, Two teams, and this is the last thing I want to show you. Do we have some other questions while it's loading, Peter? Yes, we don't allow external users because of the inability to remove accidental, disclosed, and sensitive information. Well, that makes perfect sense. I was checking in the wrong team, and that's the reason why I couldn't see my <laughs> Power App. And here is the app actually built with Dataverse within a few clicks. You build your app connected to your environment in Dataverse, you build your rows, you add your data, and now easily I can create here new data and choice, and there we go. I have my app connected to Dataverse within Teams. So, a last slide as a gift to everyone. I have, for everyone who attended that session, I have a free Microsoft Teams ebook. So, you can just easily take a copy of that ebook about Teams, about SharePoint and the integration. It is a 40, 40 pages ebook, all for you, all for free. And thank you so much, Peter, for having me. So, if you have still questions, I'll be glad to respond to them. So send me that as a link and I'll push up through the meetup, okay? Oh, sure. Okay, thank you for everyone attending. One final question. Any way for to a calendar overlay inside Teams? Can you overlay? Um, the calendar. Oh, the calendar view, the, the new calendar review option. I don't think you can overlay okay. that calendar view. Oh, no. You can though, I believe you can do that in Outlook. You can have it. In Outlook, not in Teams. In Outlook maybe, yeah, but not in Teams, right? Yes, but you can bring in the calendar into your Outlook. Yes. And then you can do it from there. All right. That's just phenomenal. We'll be sending out the tips on this. Gorian, thank you for your time and very cool presentation, I have to say. I was taking a few notes myself, actually. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much. Cheers. Bye-bye.